Um, there are organizations and companies that, that essentially what we do is help people to make complex decisions. Um, and, and there's a basis for this. Uh, the, the approach actually has its roots at Stanford and Harvard back in the 60s. Um, as often happens, it kind of developed in parallel in two places at the same time with a guy named Ron Howard out at Stanford who did not play OB on uh, <laughs> Andy Griffith's show, and then a guy named Howard Rafa up at, up at Harvard. Um, and so our company, uh, essentially what we do with our clients is that's what we bring to the table. It's sort of a structured approach to thinking your way through complex problems, especially problems where you've got uncertainty to deal with, which in business these days is pretty much everything. Um, so uh, I'd like to emphasize that we don't we don't go in and work with clients and uh, you know interview people, go away, come back with a report, and go here's what you should do. Um, that presumes that I know more about your business than you do, which is just silly. Uh, so what we do is we help our clients get a very clear understanding of the risk profiles associated with their different strategic choices, and then the client makes the decision. Uh, the reason we're here in Houston is because you're talking about making major capital investments in the face of high uncertainty. Energy companies do that all the time. So a lot of our clients are energy companies, so it kind of makes sense for us. We, we work across industries, but it makes sense to be here. So, um, my favorite part of what we do, actually, is the psychology behind this stuff. I find this stuff real interesting. I read some of the things. And, and so I put this talk together a little while ago, and um, as I say, Ron's going to have to sit there twice now, which is uh, bad for him, but good for me, um, because I get another opportunity to talk about this stuff. So, human psychological weaknesses when making decisions in the face of uncertainty. So, dead guy in the envelope. Well, what the heck does that have to do with anything? Well. Some of you, there, there's, there's a radio station here in town that has a couple of DJs that, um, I think it's Thursday mornings, they play this game called Dead Guy in the Envelope. And the way the game is played is they write the name down of some famous dead person, they stick it in an envelope, or at least you assume they are, it's radio, so you can't really tell. But, and then callers call in, callers are allowed to ask one yes or no question, they get the answer, and then they have to try to guess who the dead guy is. So as you can imagine, the first few had virtually no chance. But the, the DJs and, and Susie, the news girl, are very good about recapping what's been learned so far. And so eventually, somebody guesses who the dead guy is. Well, a few years ago, um, I was doing work for a client that was way on the other side of town of, from where I live. So I have a very long commute. So I started playing dead guy <laughs> in my head as I'm driving. <clears throat> and I noticed something really strange, which was that People would call up and they'd say something like, you know, was it a politician? And they'd say, no. And they'd go, oh, heck, I thought it was Margaret Thatcher. And, go, and no, it's not Margaret Thatcher. <coughs> and they'd say, you know, was it a baseball player? No. So it's not Babe Ruth? And no, it's not Babe Ruth. But they'd say, you know, was, was it a woman? No. Oh, I was going to guess Dorothy Parker. And no, it's not Dorothy Parker. And so you sit and you think, now think about this for a moment. Here are people that are calling up to play this game, they ask their question, they get an answer to their question, and then they make a guess that contradicts the answer they just got. Why would they do this? What's wrong with these people? Were they brought their babies? What, what happened? <laughs> and so I got thinking about this, and I'm going to let you guys think about that a little bit while I'm, while I'm talking, and we'll revisit this a little bit later as to what, what causes people to do things like that that are apparently completely irrational. Mm -hmm. So, a little bit of psychology here. Um, when it comes to potential gains, people are generally risk averse. When it comes to potential losses, people are generally gamblers. Now, the first of these isn't news to anybody. People have known about risk aversion for a long time. The second of these was a bit of an eye opener, which is that when people are looking at losses, they actually become gamblers. And every casino in the world knows this, okay? The, the, the double or nothing effect, right? But it also happens when people are working in business. <laughs> um, if there's any way they can turn something around that's doing poorly, people will continue to try, very often long past the point where it makes sense to do so. Now, okay, that's interesting enough, but these guys, um, Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman, were two of the pioneers in what has come to be called behavioral economics. And it's quite a big deal. Kahneman was given the, um, he shared, I think, 
the 2002 Nobel Prize in economics was only the second social psychologist ever to get it because of the work that they did. Tversky undoubtedly would have shared it with him, but unfortunately he had died by then. Um, so here's an example. This is straight out of a, an experiment which they did. They would go to people and they would say, okay, a new disease is spreading in Houston. It's estimated 600 people will die as a result. Two alternative programs have been proposed to combat. Program A, 200 people will definitely be saved. Program B, there's a 33% chance that 600 people will be saved and a two-thirds chance that no one will be saved. Which one would you choose? So of, of these two potential programs to combat this disease, how many of you would choose A? How many would choose B? Oh, come on, people. Nobody's going to die here. <laughs> how many people would choose A? Okay, how many people would choose B? And, and point out that unexpected number of people saved basis, they're the same, and that's important. Okay. When they ran this experiment, 72% chose A. Okay? Almost three out of four wanted to make sure that they saved the 200 people. Okay? But wait, two new programs come along. Program C, if you do that, 400 people will definitely die. When program D, there's a one-third chance nobody will die, and a 67% chance that 600 people will die. Now, more than three-quarters chose D. Now, the, the astute among you will have noticed that these are the same two programs. Okay? A is the same as C, B is the same as D. The only difference is one is framed in terms of how many people you're going to save, the other is framed in terms of how many people are going to die. <laughs> and people chose radically different um, programs. Now, you may think, okay, that's interesting. This isn't just interesting. This blows the doors off the notion of a rational free market. In fact, it blows the doors off of most economic analysis. Because underpinning almost all economic theory is the assumption that with whatever information people have at hand, they will make a decision that is in their own best interest. No, they won't. They won't even make the same decision when the facts are identical in two cases. It all depends on how the information is <coughs> This is huge. In terms of economics, this is enormous. And this is why it began to be called behavioral economics. <coughs> is classical economics is all this theoretical stuff. And what Kahneman and Tversky kind of led the charge on was, why don't we have economics which actually tries to model how people really behave? Mm -hmm. No, because it's a lot more complicated, for one thing. But that's no reason not to try. So the bottom line is, if if it doesn't matter if it's a business project, a disease, whatever, if you frame it in terms of potential gains, most people become risk averse. They'll take the sure thing if possible. The exact same facts, but frame it in terms of potential losses, and people become risk seeking. They will gamble. So if you're proposing a project and you want to manipulate people into doing one or the other, you can frame it one way or the other. And don't think that people don't do this stuff. Certainly salespeople do. Okay? This happens now. Th that experiment, they, they intentionally made it non-financial because they they didn't want something that was just specific to money. But then they went ahead and did it with money as well. So here was another choice they gave people: a sure fight of two hundred forty dollars, or a twenty-five percent chance of receiving a thousand dollars. Vast majority took A. Okay, even though the expected value, the average is is low, right? Twenty-five percent of a thousand being two hundred fifty dollars. Um, doesn't matter. You're only giving people one shot at this, and so they take the two, the surefire 240. And then they gave people a choice. Here, suppose I've got you cornered or something and you can't escape, and you either take a surefire loss of $750 or a 75% chance of losing 1000 the vast majority will take the gamble. Because there's a one in four chance you might be able to slip out the door without losing anything. Okay, so this is just sort of reaffirming what we saw before. But look at what happens when you look at this on a portfolio basis. The most popular portfolio was A and D. If you had to choose one of each of these, most people took A and D. The least popular was B and C. Let's look at them at a portfolio level. If you combine those two, you have a 25% probability of coming out $240 ahead, 75% probability, probability of losing $760, and the expected value of the average is a loss of $510. 
B and C, the least popular portfolio, 25% probability of coming out 250 ahead, 75% probability of losing 750, expected value of losing 500. On every single measure, B and C is better than A and D. So when we put portfolios together based on our personal preferences on an individual project basis, we create suboptimal portfolios. And, and this is actually, this is a related topic, was what I went around I was a year and a half ago, almost two years ago now. I was a distinguished lecturer for the Society of Petroleum Engineers. And that my topic was how people should not be applying their risk tolerance on a project by project basis. You should be doing it at the portfolio basis. And in fact, you should be looking at all of your economic measures on a portfolio basis when a project is included rather than on that individual project. And we do it all the time. It's just so. But, again, what Kahneman and, Kahneman and Traversky found was it all depends on the odds, too. Okay, there are these generalizations. If you're looking at gains, people are risk-averse. Risk if you're looking at losses, people are risk-seeking. <coughs> but if you look in a situation like this, a legal situation, you've got Al and Ben, each of them are separate lawsuits, not suing the same person, but separate, separate lawsuits for $10 million. Al has been told by his legal gurus or whatever powers that be that he has a 90% chance of winning and he gets offered a seven and a half million dollar settlement. Ben has been told, look, this is a long shot. You've only got a 5% chance really of this thing winning. And he gets offered 800,000. Who do you think is more likely to set? Who? Al. Who should be more likely to set? Ben, right? He's being offered more than the probability weighted value of going through with the trial. Al is far more likely to sell. Far more likely to sell. Because not only are we risk averse, we are loss averse, we are regret averse. And if Al goes to trial and happens to be unlucky and be in that 10% and he loses, he's going to be kicking himself forever because he could have had seven and a half million bucks. So it's easy to see why Al would go ahead and settle. Ben's is a little harder to get your head around, and it really does depend on Ben's financial situation. But what it comes down to is, when the probability is small, I think this is the next one, when, if the probability of success is low, but the impact is high, people turn around and become gamblers again. It's the lottery effect. Okay? I mean, 800,000 bucks is nothing to sneeze at, but it's not as life-changing as 10 million. And so he may be willing to forego the surefire 800,000, for a one in 20 shot at 10 million. Okay, people do this with lottery tickets all the time. And then what, when you flip it out, if you're looking at potential losses, where people are normally gamblers, if the probability of loss is low, but the impact is high, we become risk averse again. We insure ourselves. You know, I mean, really, what is the probability your house is going to burn down? Pretty small, right? And yet we all have homeowners in charge, right? So we. we Huh? It's required. It's required. Well, even, if, even if you own your house free and clear and it's not required, I don't know anybody who wouldn't carry homeowners insurance, right? I know one person who wouldn't carry homeowners insurance. Okay. So is irrational decision making, right? by, by all measures, this is irrational, okay? By the way, we usually define rationality. Now, you can twist the definition of rationality to mean whatever you want it to mean, basically to mean that I want to accomplish whatever I feel like accomplishing. But typically, we mean, you know, things that where you can explain the logic and it, and it all makes sense to people. So is, it, is this in our genes? And, and even if it's in our genes, why have a picture of a cute little monkey up there? Um, well, this guy, Keith Chen, is at the Yale School of Business, and he and his cohorts did experiments with capuchin monkeys. And, and I honestly don't, if some of you are or zoologist, and that's not a capuchin monkey, I apologize, I just found a cute picture of a monkey on the internet. Um, but anyway, so they did experiments with capuchin monkeys where they gave them allowances of coins. Okay, and initially the monkeys would just throw the coins, drop them, whatever. But they fairly quickly realized that these silly humans were willing to trade them food for these useless discs of metal. And so then, you know, by God, the monkeys realized these things were worth something. And so they, and they would, they would sell them apple slices and grapes and orange sections and all this other stuff. And the interesting thing is fairly quickly, prices stabilized. You know, I mean, the monkeys would even buy stuff from each other occasionally or exchange coins. And so you sort of established this jungle economy, which was kind of nice. 
And and then they, so they said, all right, well let's 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 see what happens if we change things. So they I want to make sure I get this right. I think initially the monkeys had an allowance of like 12 coins a day. That got cut down to eight, but the price of apple slices was cut in half. So two for one sale on apple slices. Okay? And you can use economic theory to predict by how much should the demand for apple slices go up. And it worked perfectly, like within 1%. So there's only one conclusion you can draw from this. Monkeys are rational consumers, right? <laughs> Which is more than I can say from any of my friends, right? So then they did a couple of other experiments. They set up trading regimes where they would have two salespeople, OK? And the salespeople would behave in different ways. In trading regime number one, salesman A would offer and deliver one apple slice, right, for a point. Salesman B would offer two, but half the time would only <coughs> deliver one, right? Pull one away, half the time. So monkeys actually preferred salesman B because on average, you, you, sometimes you got an extra apple slice. Right, so it's still rational. Right? Then they set up trading regime two. Now in trading regime number two, salesman A offered one, but half the time gave them an extra. Salesman B did as before, offered two, but half the time pulled one away. So on average, you're going to get the same from each salesperson. What do you think happened? They preferred A, definitely. And if any of you are in sales, this doesn't surprise you. A consumer who thinks he's getting something extra, whether he is or isn't, is a happy consumer. A consumer who thinks he just got hosed is an unhappy consumer, whether he really did or not, and whether the consumer is a monkey or not, apparently. <laughs> so this isn't entirely rational anymore, but there's still uncertainty in there. So they did a third one. In this one, salesman A is back to where he was originally. He offers and delivers one apple slice, that's it. Salesman B now offers two, but only delivers one every time. So now it doesn't matter who you go to, you're getting one apple slice. The monkeys preferred salesman A even more strongly. It just cheesed them off that this guy would offer two and then pull one back. Right? So there's no real there's no way to explain this other than emotion, because they're getting the same thing ultimately. But it just made them angry. Right? So let's talk a little bit about that. Emotions and decision making. Right. Now this is an experiment, I don't know who did this originally, so I don't have a reference for it, um, but it's been done a zillion times where they play this game. You have two players come in, player one gets $10 and is allowed to decide how to split that $10 with player two any way she wants to, let's say, okay? Player two then can accept or reject the offer. There's no negotiation, they only play once, one offer and that's it. If player two accepts, then they each get the money in the agreed upon split. If player two rejects, nobody gets any money. And they know this when they go into it. So, what should player two do, logically? Always accept, right? Because you get something that way, at least. You get nothing if you reject. You think that's what happens? Heck no. What happens, this guy, Alan Sanfi, is a, is a neurologist. He put a, a fMRI hookup on player two's head to observe brain activity when this game is being played. And what we see is activity in two parts of the brain. The frontal cortex, which is where logical reasoning and accomplishing of goals and things like that all takes place, you'd see activity. But then you sometimes you'd also see activity in the part of the brain that's this kind of in the more primitive part of your brain, what Gardner Morris calls our dog brains, um, and, and in the part of the brain that deals with negative emotions, anger, spite, resentment, all this other stuff. And as the offer became more and more unfair, you saw less activity there and more activity in the, in the emotional center. And I, I don't know about any of the rest of you, but I can relate to this. I mean, I'm Irish. I, I, I've been in conversations with people that, that, you know, you get arguing with somebody or they get heated. And afterward, I think, oh my God, why did I say that? You know, I just kind of lost it for a moment and said something that, that really was inappropriate. Um, it happens sometimes, unless you're like a Zen master or something. And, and so this part of our brain sort of takes over sometimes, say, especially depending upon your nationality. Um, in my case, it takes it over a So emotions are bad, right? You need to get emotions out of decision making. Well, not necessarily. This guy, Antonio Damasio, is another neurologist. Um, and he worked with patients who had suffered damage to the part of the brain. It's the anterior insula, I think. 
is the part of the brain that processes emotions. And so they had either had physical damage or they'd suffered a stroke, which, which did damage this part of their brain or, or something. But this part of their brain is damaged. Now, when that part of your brain is damaged, um, you, your IQ doesn't change perceptively. Your speech ability, your mathematical ability, none of that changes. The only thing that happens is you can't process emotions. And so they, they, as a test on this, they would show people, you know, like horrible pictures of, of burn victims, war wounds, um, you know, people who had, you know, all kinds of horrendous things that would cause the rest of us to just cringe, crying scenes. And, and they just show no reaction whatsoever because they don't process emotions. They also cannot make a decision to save their lives. And this was, this was a bit of a surprise, okay? Um, Damasio talks about one guy that he had that would go into work and he'd have, uh, for lack of a better way of putting it, he'd have a bunch of things he had to work on that day, a bunch of files, let's say. And he would spend the entire day trying to decide which one to work on first. You know, should he do them in chronological order? Should he start with the biggest one and get it out of the way? Or maybe start with a small one so he can knock it out quickly and move on the entire day. And even when colleagues would come up and say, look, you're not getting anything done. Just pick one. Do it. You can't. You can't just pick one. You can't make a decision. In fact, Damasio, he talks about one patient that he had where they had just finished their session and they had to schedule another session for, you know, the next month or something and they agree, okay, you know, this week and Damasio looks at his schedule and says, okay, I have Tuesday open and Wednesday open. Which do you want? guy pulls out his calendar, looks at it, Tuesday and Wednesday are both wide open in this guy's calendar. And he sat there for 45 minutes. Was somebody more likely to come by on Tuesday and so on so occasionally has lunch with me and that, that probably would be Wednesday if he calls me and this day. And, and Demasio said he took all of his own restraint not to you know, reach across the desk, grab him by the little belt, and say, for God's sake, just pick one. But the guy can't help it. I mean, if you don't, if you don't process emotions, you can't make decisions. And again, this, this sort of, it's a surprise that it's that strong, but the fact that emotions play such a role in decision making isn't that big a surprise. So you have to strike a balance. I mean, that's kind of statement of the obvious. But you, you need logic, you need thinking. Um, to go back to Daniel Kahneman for a moment, Kahneman recently wrote a book called Thinking Fast and Slow. Recently, I was in the last three years or so. Thinking Fast and Slow, great book. It is a lifetime of wisdom on this subject. Now, it's a big book, but it's not that difficult to read. It's not filled with psychological gobbledygook or anything like that. Um, and he describes system one versus system two thinking. System one is the dog brain part. It's our intuitive, emotional, go with your gut type of thinking. And for about 99% of what we do, it's fine. You know, you wouldn't want to have to you know, crunch numbers to decide what shirt to wear today or what to have for lunch. Um, and it's always turned on, so it's always there. System two is our logical, calculating, hang on a minute, let's think about this for a while style of thinking. It uses the cerebral, the cerebral cortex more. Um, and it's obviously far better in complex situations and that's basically what my company does, is try to get people to engage that part of their brain more and, in fact, use tools to gain insights in cases where our brains simply can't process that kind of data. But the problem with System 2 is it's lazy. If you're given a choice between going with a rule of thumb or your gut and sitting down and actually doing some analysis, most people will do the former if they can get away with it. Right? So, our, our perspective here is you really need both, okay? You do the analysis, you do the thinking. Sometimes this actually involves literally crunching numbers. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it just involves framing the problem up correctly, thinking your way through it, talking it out, making sure you're understanding all of the possibilities. Um, but then, ultimately, you still want to supplement, you want to use that to supplement the decision makers intuition, experience, judgment, business sense, all that, not supplant, okay? Nobody's talking about do blindly do what the model says. That's just crazy. Okay. 
But emotions aren't the only problem that we run into here, okay? I've been talking about emotions for a few minutes, but we've got other issues in how we think and how we make decisions in complex situations or in uncertain situations. Um, again, this is more common and diversity stuff. There are others that have done this work too. Uh, payments or costs are preferred to losses. This is another experiment that they did. They go around and they ask people, here's a game which you may play if you'd like. In this game, you have a 10% chance of winning $95 and a 90% chance of losing $5. Do you want to play? And some percentage of people would say, sure, I'll play. Then they'd offer people this game, not the same people, but a whole bunch of different people. In this game, you have a 10% chance of winning $100, a 90% chance of winning nothing, and it costs $5 to play. Do you want to play? Now, obviously, same as before. Same game, right? Same result. Game two is strongly preferred. Okay? And the only difference is that's a loss. And that's a cost. We don't like costs, but we hate losses <coughs> to the point where we're irrational about it. Okay? So, you know, I, you read enough of this stuff and you wonder how we ever get anything done. It, it's hard. <laughs> so I, I took this in. There, there, I'm sure there are more than four reasons why it's hard to kill a bad project. If any of you have ever worked on a bad project, I have. Um, but I, this led me to at least four, right? Number one, sunk costs. We all know we're supposed to ignore sunk costs, and you should ignore sunk costs when making a decision because they're sunk, they're gone, have nothing to do with what's going to happen in the future, but easier said than done. Number two, when faced with potential losses, people become gamblers, okay? So as long as there's any chance we can turn this baby around, people will hang in there and keep throwing good money after bad. But number three, as long as that project's still alive, the money, the good money you're throwing after bad is cost. As soon as you walk away from it and kill it, there are losses. And we hate losses. And number four is just, in, in a lot of corporate cultures, if you're managing a killed project, that can be what is known as a CLM, or a career limiting move, right? <laughs> so that's another reason why people will not accept that, um, <coughs> that this is a that, that, the project's a dog and they should just um, I spent uh, 22 years at Texaco. I was a geophysicist before doing what I'm doing now. And there was one project when I, when I was working in the North Sea for a while, there was a project that was just a horrendously bad project. And one poor guy after another got pulled in to manage that project. And it was just politically unacceptable for any of them to turn and say, this is a horrible project, shut it down. It's like, well, that's not a can-do attitude, you know? That's not why we brought you in. So, you can't do it. Uh, a few other things. The free phenomenon. This is Dan Ariely. Ariely's got a book um, called Predictably Irrational, which is a very entertaining book, easy to read, um, lots of fun, all on this subject. So, they set up a little stand at a, um, at, at a conference outside the door. They got permission to do this, obviously. And at their stand, they gave people a choice. They could buy one lint truffle for 15 cents, or a Hershey kiss for a penny. And almost three out of four bought the lint truffle, because if you're going to buy chocolate, you might as well buy good chocolate, right? Then they set up in another place, and in this case, the lint truffle was 14 cents, the Hershey kiss was free. 69% go for the Hershey kiss. So as soon as anybody's offered free stuff, they become completely irrational. And we've all seen this, too. We've probably all done it, right? Um, other revelations, common for us, Richard Thaler, Cass Sunstein, Dan Ariely, all, these are all really excellent researchers in this. In fact, Sunstein for a while was, um, he, he was working as the uh, president's advisor on, I think it was regulation or something like that, because he's, his, his approach to it was a free market, just nudge in the right direction, make the defaults good things and let people have free choices. But anyway, additional revelations, the endowment phenomenon, which Richard Thaler did a lot of work on, which is, if I own it, I like it more than if you own it, even if it's identical, okay? And um, Ariely talks about this in his book, uh, Duke University, uh, right, is basketball crazy. And just to prove it, the students there, if they want to have a shot at getting season tickets to the basketball season, they have to submit themselves to torture, basically. I mean, they have to show up, and if they live outside in this area and, and at random intervals a bell is rung and they have to run down and check in or else their name gets taken off the list. And they do this for days, okay? Um, at the end of which, if you survive, all that happens is your name gets put in a hopper 
and you get a, ra a random drawing for the basketball tickets. So even after all that, you're not guaranteed of getting basketball tickets. So the reason that Ariely targeted this was because the, the torture process will basically control for how badly do these people want basketball tickets. Everybody who goes through it really must want these basketball tickets. And yet afterwards, you've got some who have them and some who don't. And so he went up to the ones who have them, who are rejoicing and drinking in the local beer, in the local pubs, and, and asked them, you know, hey, you got basketball tickets. You know, what's the minimum amount you take for those tickets? And I don't remember what the number was exactly, but I think the average was something like 2,200 bucks. And then you go up to the people who were crying and wailing and gnashing their teeth. Oh, geez, it's a shame you didn't get basketball tickets. What's the maximum you'd pay for basketball tickets? 600 bucks on average. Now, again, there's no logical reason for that. Either you would rather have $1,000 in your pocket or you'd rather have basketball tickets in your pocket. No, it depends on what you actually have in your pocket. Again, irrational behavior. And, and this is no big deal if you're you know, selling stuff in a yard sale. But if you're in charge of acquisitions and divestitures for your company, this is important. The immediacy phenomenon, something's just happened, it looms large in our minds. You know, plane crashes and nobody flies for like, you know, a month, and then they go back to it. Um, anchoring, this is another one that's really interesting. We have to deal with this all the time because a lot of what we do with clients is, is trying to elicit inputs for probabilistic models. We, we do some probabilistic economic modeling for clients um, in addition to facilitating the teams as they think through it. And so you've got to pull numbers out of people, and you have to be really, really careful. You can't just send out a spreadsheet and say, fill this in. One of the problems we deal with is anchoring, which is as soon as somebody has a number in front of them, they grab a hold of it with both hands and will not let it go. And if it's the number that was put in the budget, well, geez, it's gospel, you know? <laughs> But even when it's a random number, people grab a hold of it and are influenced by it. So again, Ariely talks about, and I think Kahneman talks about it too, an experiment that they did where they get people in a room and they give them a list of products with values ranging from about $10 up to maybe $100 thereabouts. <coughs> and they'd have everybody write down in the column next to the list of products a dollar sign and the last two digits of their social security number which is obviously random, right? So you have some people in the room who happen to have, you know, 94 is the last year. So they're writing $94, $94, $94. Somebody else in the room somewhere has 07, so they're writing $7, $7, $7, $7. Okay. Then they said, would you pay that much for each of these products? So not too surprisingly, the 94s are mostly writing no, and then the 7s are mostly writing yes, and in between, you've got everything in between. Then they ask them, what's the maximum amount you would pay for each of these products? And the 94s will consistently pay more than the 7s. Now, that's how pathetic we are. I mean, there's no reason for that, other than the fact that if the last number you saw was 94, 58 bucks doesn't sound so bad. If the last number you saw was 7, 58 bucks is an outrage, right? I even read somewhere, I haven't seen this, I haven't been able to dig up this research, but I read that we will actually spend more money in a restaurant called Cafe 95 than we will in a restaurant called Cafe 25. I mean, that's how pathetic we are. It's just, as I say, it's amazing we ever get anything. Uh, the pain of a loss is greater than the pleasure of a gain of equal size. So if you find 20 bucks on your way to work, you're happy for an hour. If you lose 20 bucks on your way to work, you're a miserable cuss all day. And the, the corollary to this is volatility hurts. Even if the overall trend is upward in some investment you've made, if it's bouncing around, the, the good that you feel when it's gone up does not outweigh the bad that you feel when it turns around and goes down by almost as much the next day. Again, this, this colors our decision making. People underweigh events with probabilities less than one and greater than zero. Uh, what this means is people will overpay for certainty. People will pay far more to put the probability of success of a project from 90% to 100% than they will to move from 60% to 75%. Even though the latter is obviously worth a lot more. It's just the way we are. The exception, again, rare high impact events. Okay. Okay, so, hey, remember dead guy in the envelope? Right, we were wondering why it is that these people call up and ask a question and then give an answer that violates the, the uh, or make a guess that violates the answer that they just got? Well, this is an experiment that was originally done by P.C. Weissen. Um, and what he would do is he'd put up a, a number series in front of a crowd like, like you guys. 
And he'd say, okay, I used some rule in making this number series, and your job is to guess the rule. And here's how you guess. You give me a number series, and I'll tell you whether or not it follows the rule. And then you have to guess what the rule is. So invariably, somebody goes 12, 14, 16, 18, 20. Yes, that follows the rule. Now, is it uh, consecutive even numbers? No, that's not the rule. So somebody goes 1, 3, 5, 7, 9. Yes, that follows the rule. Is it alternate numbers? No, that's not the rule. 3, 6, 9, 12, 15. Yes, that follows the rule. Is it evenly spaced numbers along the number line? No, that's not the rule. And eventually people get very frustrated because nobody ever guesses what the rule is because the rule is incredibly stupid. The rule is that each number has to be bigger than the one before. <laughs> so, you know, you put in, you know, minus 10, 0.2, pi, and a billion, and it would still work, right? That's not what's really interesting. What's really interesting is that just like with dead guy, what people do is they first try to figure out what the rule is, right? You've got a rule in mind before you come up with your number series, right? No one ever, ever, ever puts forward a number series that contradicts the rule they have in mind. No one ever seeks out negative feedback. Everyone seeks out positive feedback. They want reassurance that what they're thinking is correct. Okay? And this is exacerbated in today's world where you can, if you make a half-hearted effort, never be exposed to any opinions that don't confirm those that you already hold. That's why conservatives watch Fox. It's why liberals watch MSNBC. God forbid that any of us should hear anything that we don't already believe, right? And so people preferentially, this is Max Bateman and Dolly Hsu who did this work, people actively seek out, preferentially believe, and in fact, in many cases, fail to even see or register information that doesn't confirm their currently held position, okay? Um, ignore and sometimes actually fail to see information that contradicts their currently held positions. We all have this tendency. You can make a conscious effort to fight it, but you have to make a conscious effort to fight it because your subconscious is going to push you towards affirmation. And this is really dangerous in business. Okay? So one of the problems with this is lack of contingency plan. Okay? You come up with a plan and by God, everybody wants the plan to work. It's a brilliant plan because we're brilliant and we came up with it. Nobody, or it's, it can be very awkward to say, what if it goes wrong? What if that doesn't happen? Okay? And yet if you don't do that, you're leaving yourself wide open to surprises. So again, a lot of the work we do with our clients is try to get them to recognize the full range of possibilities that can happen, and then what are signposts that can tell us it's going this way or that way? Um, and if we see it going this way or that way, what are we going to do? How do we position ourselves to take advantage of the upside to protect ourselves against the downside? This type of thinking is important because people preferentially want validation. So to take off on that a little bit, I'm going to talk a little bit about groupthink. And some of you may have heard this term. Um, Irving Janus didn't actually coin the term, I found out, but he kind of made it famous because he wrote a paper in 1971 using the Bay of Pigs invasion as an example. Um, and with the Bay of Pigs, I mean, everybody pretty much, whether they, they liked the Kennedy administration or not, they conceded that the people that he gathered were brilliant people. I mean, they were really, you know, they called them the best and the brightest, and it was really quite an impressive collection of intellect that they had in the White House at the time. And, and, and yet, they made incredibly stupid decisions leading up to and culminating in the Bay of Pigs uh, invasion. And, and Janice was just fascinated by this. How in the world does this happen? So this is, this is sort of the, the definition that he gives in his paper, where people become so concerned with concurrence, with, with unanimity, and with feeling that everybody's on board, all for one, one for all, all this stuff, we're the good team, that they tend to back off from, or don't do as good a job as they should, of realistically appraising what's going on and what their chances are. So, very often they are comprised of highly skilled, intelligent people. Why should that be? Well, if, let's say, if, if Ron and I are on the same team and I think he's just absolutely brilliant, 
and he comes out with something that I think is the stupidest idea I've ever heard, if I think he's absolutely brilliant, I'm not going to say that's the stupidest idea I've ever heard. I'm going to sit there and go, huh, he's brilliant, and he thinks this is a good idea. I, you know, I'm obviously the one who's wrong. And so people tend to withhold criticism when there's tremendous mutual respect in the team. You get a bunch of people together who really don't think much of each other, and this doesn't be, this isn't as big a problem. Okay? Well, this is why you hear so much about Lincoln's, you know, team of rivals. Okay? They had no problem at all calling each other out and calling each other idiots. And, and Lincoln took advantage of it. A uh, strong sense of purpose. We're the good guys, all for one, as I said. Um, high levels of camaraderie, mutual respect, all this stuff contributes. And they have, they, if they really believe that this is, this is a, a holy mission that they're on, it becomes all stronger, right? So, symptoms, an illusion of invulnerability. We can't go wrong. This is brilliant. You know, nothing, nothing could go wrong. Uh, and as a result of that, any information they get, which indicates, eh, maybe it could, or even it is going wrong, rationalize away. Yeah. No, no, can't be. Um, this happens a fair amount, too, is you start to believe that not only are you smarter than everybody else, you are more moral. You are morally superior to everyone else. Okay? And this is the nasty consequence of that, is it becomes very easy to rationalize away bending the rules and doing things that you would find appalling in anybody else, because we're the good guys, and we've got the, the proper purpose, and therefore it's okay. Enemies are viewed as stereotypes. Okay, I've worked with clients where, you know, you'll ask them, well, how do, what's your planning to? How does that sit with your partners? Oh, they're ready. You know, we don't get, well, no, they're not idiots, actually. They're, they're, they're pretty good at what they do. Um, and, and that's a partner. That's not even an enemy. Okay? It's really easy to, you know, with an enemy to say, oh, you, you just, you can't rational. You can't, you know, negotiate with those people. They're, they're just irrational. They're crazy. No, they're not. In, in fact, there's a, a colleague, Catherine Rosbeck, who gave a talk a few years ago at one of the conferences that I went to, where she said one of her latest buzz phrases was, why does that make perfect sense? in the sense of, if you're in a situation and you're looking at what a competitor is doing or a partner or a regulator or whatever, and what they're doing makes no sense to you whatsoever, figure out how it makes sense to them. Because to them, it makes perfect sense. And if you want to be good at your job, you're, you will figure out why it makes perfect sense to them. And it, it gives you a perspective into how they're looking at things. And that's a huge advantage. Uh, anybody who expresses doubt, kind of gets ostracized. They don't get invitations to the next meeting. Um, Self-censorship, as a result of that, people stop expressing doubt. As a result of that, everyone thinks that everyone agrees. And it gets to the point where the members of the group actually act as what Janice called mind guards, in the sense that they actually protect each other from information that questions the plan. Especially the leader of the group gets shielded from any information that might cause him or her to question the plan. So as a result, few alternative courses of action are discussed. This is disastrous. Probably the most important thing that anybody would care if you're looking to invade another country or if you're looking to just roll out a strategic initiative within your company, probably the most important thing to do is actually come up with several different strategic alternatives and take a look at them and evaluate them, okay? Because if all you do is come up with one idea, <coughs> then basically what are your choices? Yes or no? Okay? Develop good alternatives. Uh, the agreed course of action is never re-examined. Nobody ever takes a step back and goes, hang on a minute. You know, things have changed. This is a stupid idea. Um, right, nothing, nobody ever talks about, well, what are we missing here? They don't seek out expert opinion, and when experts volunteer opinions, they're often ignored. And this is exactly what we talked about a little bit earlier. People preferentially believe facts that support things, okay? Um, nobody ever talks about possible disasters that could happen, and so nobody ever develops contingency plans. Now, one of the, one of the things that, that we encourage people to do, anytime you're doing anything, is what Gary Klein has called a pre-mortem or a pre-celebration which is where you look, you say, okay, it's 10 years down the road, we're looking back on this project, it was a disaster. It was a total train wreck, people ran for cover, what happened? 
And for some reason, when you put it to people that way, I'm not asking, could it be a disaster? I'm telling you, as a fact, it happened, it was horrible. People get quite creative at coming up with events and uncertainties and things that could derail this and cause it to be a mess. And then you also want to do it the other way, the pre-celebration. It's 10 years down the road, we're looking at this, and it was better than anybody could possibly imagine. It was spectacular. What happened? And, and that way, the, the idea is to de-anchor people, to break people away from the notion that they actually can predict what's going to happen. And it might be a whole lot worse or a whole lot better. And then you can start having a conversation on, okay, if this starts to happen, what would we do differently? What would we have wished we had done? Can we position ourselves now to take advantage of all of these different scenarios, or at least a good number of them? So how do you fight groupthink, okay? Number one, the leader needs to be honestly interested in other people's ideas, okay? A lot of leaders say that, oh, my door is always open, come in and tell me anything. People very quickly pick up on whether you mean that or not, okay? Uh, Appointed devil's advocate. This is actually pretty fun when you're the devil's advocate, especially. So in every team meeting as the project progresses, and it should be a different person each time because there's no reason for one person to have all the fun. <laughs> but one person gets designated, you know, your job in this meeting today is to tell us why what we're planning is going to go disastrously wrong. Okay? And it is. It's fun. Um, and then the next time it's somebody else. Um, the leader has to accept criticism. That kind of goes with, with number one there. And, and one way to do this is in the first few meetings, if you're the leader, keep your mouth shut. Let other people talk. Listen. Okay? Um, and, and depending upon where you're working in different parts of the world, I spent four years in Indonesia, and the culture there is much more one of the boss decides and the boss says what's going to happen, and then we, our job is to make it happen. Um, and so if you really want honest opinions out of people, the boss shouldn't even be in the room for the first few meetings. Okay? And for that matter, I don't know if it's, it's probably not unique to the Indonesian culture, but you really want to talk to people one-on-one -on -one behind closed doors so that their opinions get recorded anonymously. Um, because public harmony is a highly held value, and they're not going to get in a room and disagree with each other. Now, it depends. I mean, there are different cultures within the country. The Botox in West Sumatra will argue with each other just fine. But Javanese, not going to happen. So, so things like this. Be aware of stuff like this. You've got to think of this. And even if you're not dealing with a culture that's like that, we, we all have a tendency to fall into group things. Imagine training it, the pre and post mortem, okay? A survey of warning signs. Um, you know, what will tell you that you're headed for a train wreck and how what might you do in those cases? Pre mortems, there you go. Uh, alternative courses of action. Um, we used to have a guy who worked with us, he, he actually now works for a pharmaceutical company, has a PhD from Stanford, studied under Ron Howard, you know, the, one of the, I'd say he's literally one of the smartest guys I've ever met. Um, and we once asked him, you know, when you look at all the stuff that we work with clients to do, if they don't have time to, to kind of think about all this stuff, what's the one thing that you would really want them to do? And his initial reaction was, ah, you know, you, you, you got to do more than just one thing. But he came in the next day and he said, you know, I thought about it. You're right. You know, sometimes people just only have time to do something. This was it. In his mind, the most important thing for a team of people to do, if they are looking at a big strategic decision, is think of creative alternatives that you might do. Um, a wise thought. I don't like to read my slides literally, but I'll read this one. Never hire or promote in your own image. It is foolish to replicate your strength. It is idiotic to replicate your weakness. It is essential to employ, trust, and reward those whose perspective, ability, and judgment are radically different from yours. It also is rare, but requires uncommon humility, tolerance, and wisdom. Now, a lot of you are probably wondering who in the world is D. Hawk. D. Hawk took a little-known credit card back in the 70s called Bank AmeriCard and turned it into Visa. So for better or for worse, he's probably as responsible as anybody for our current credit-driven economy. But one thing you've got to give the guy is he probably knows a thing or two about business. And this really is important. I honestly think this comes to play in a lot of companies, even companies that are well-intended on have, you know, soliciting diverse opinions and having a diverse group. When the time comes at, say, lower to middle management levels for the, the leader of the group to choose a successor, 
he's likely, very often, he or she is likely to, even if, even if he appreciates all the different opinions, if there's somebody in the group who, smart guy, but he disagrees with me on almost everything, he's, in the back of his mind, he's going to be, you know, he just doesn't quite get it. The person that's likely to be chosen to succeed, it, to succeed that person, is the person whose uh, train of thought is similar to his own. And so by the time you get all the way up to the very senior ranks, you, you tend to have a lot more homogeneous executive than really is optimal for the company. It's a hard thing to fight. You're fighting human nature. But as D. Hawk points out, you got to try. I mean, Abraham Lincoln was able to do it. So when is it okay to trust your gut? I mean, here I've been railing away about how incompetent we all are and how we, we, none of us get anything done correctly. Well. Daniel Kahneman and Gary Klein did some, a lot of work on this stuff, and they came up with four tests. Okay? Number one, familiarity. Do you have a lot of experience in these circumstances? If you do, good. If you don't, you should probably forget. Number two, did you get consistent, reliable feedback? Um, this is an issue when we work with energy companies. The exploration department in an energy company is a place where the choices you make today don't give you feedback until sometimes five, ten years down the road. And by then, everyone's moved on to new jobs. So that's a problem. It's hard to learn from experience in that type of a business. Um, equanimity, where the situation is emotionally charged, right? This is emotion coming very upsetting. And the lack of bias. Is it going to affect you personally if choice A is, is gone with, or, or if we go with choice B? Um, that will change things, OK? And their perspective is, if you fail even one of these, you really ought to be using some sort of structured framework for making your decisions, not just intuition and instinct. Um, anybody here read Malcolm Gladwell's book, Blink? Yeah. It's, in my opinion, it's, it's, it's a well-written, entertaining, ultimately misleading book. <laughs> Seriously. I mean, and, and, and everything, is, it's, it's good stuff that he talks about, but I have two really big problems with with the book. Number one is he presents anecdotes as though they were statistics. And, and one of the few clever things I've ever heard come out of the mouth of a politician was when Barbara Boxer, a senator from California, said the plural of anecdote is not data. Okay? It's not. And Gladwell does not present any statistics. He tells stories. They're fascinating stories. Um, but that's one problem. The second problem is the examples that he gives in which people who went with their gut, went with their instincts and their immediate subconscious, made the right choice, invariably fall into one of two categories. Either they are situations for which we have evolved skills. Detecting, sensing danger, reading people's faces. These are things that, as social animals, we have evolved skills for. Or the person had 40 years of experience. Okay, He talks about an art historian right up in the very beginning of the book who, when, when a new Greek chorus was presented to her, she immediately knew it was fake. She couldn't say how, she didn't know why, all the paperwork was absolutely impeccable, she knew it was fake. Okay? Couldn't say how. Uh, Vic Braden, the tennis coach back in the 70s, was talking about, he was watching a match on TV, and he began to notice that when a, a player would fall on their first serve, and then start into their second serve, it, just as they started into their motion, he could tell if they were going to double fault or not. And he started, he even creeped himself out because he started keeping score, and he was like 93% accurate. Well, Braden had coached zillions of people, okay? If you're in that situation, by all means, listen to your instincts. But if you're not, the problem I have with Gladwell's books is he doesn't pin it down to that. He basically says we should all do that all the time. No. Okay, quick word of warning from Kruger and Dunning. Okay, it's tempting to say, yeah, you know, all these other people, they're all silly, but, but I now know this and I'm not going to act this way anymore. Um, people who lack expertise in a given area tend to overestimate their abilities. And people who are in the top quartile generally underestimate. So if you're really cocky about your abilities in something, that's not necessarily a good sign. <laughs> So quick summary, people and monkeys are often irrational when making decisions. Um, you should always ask yourself, is this a case where I can safely trust my instincts? Okay? Now, not when you're deciding what to have for lunch, but you know, in any serious decision-making situation, try to be objective. Get away from groupthink, appoint 
devil's advocates, things like that. Listen to your gut, but don't be ruled by it. Okay? Sort of reasonable advice, you know, whether you're making business decisions or on a diet. Um, and then this is another quote that I like by Owen Miller. To be absolutely certain about something, one must know everything or nothing about it. So again, if you're absolutely sure about something, you might give a little thought as to what you can't and fall into. Um, here are a number of the references that I talked about. Um, I, I like to put this up just because the Kruger and Dunning, read the title of that. Unskilled and unaware of how difficulties in recognizing one's own incompetence lead to inflated self-assessment. <laughs> I'd like to have been part of that study. Um, but all these books, Dan Ariely's books, great book, uh, the Heath Brothers book, there's Irving Janice's paper. Um, this Kahneman and Tversky is not a book you sit down and read, it's actually a compilation of research. Um, but it's still a, a really good reference. Kruger and Dunning, all these other. Nate Silver, he got a lot of uh, press uh, in the last presidential election because he predicted like what every, how every state would vote except one or something like that, and, and all the same votes. Nassim Talib got a lot of press when he wrote, his second book was the Black Swan book, and I think everybody wrote about that. Uh, Fooled by Randomness was his first one, he now has another one called Anti-Fragile. Um, and, and he's a smart, smart guy, but he's really, really grumpy. And you have to kind of get around that. He's just angry at everybody. Um, but a lot of good stuff in there. Um, and I also like the title of this, Mistakes Were Made But Not By Me. Um, <laughs> Carol Tavis and Ellie there. And I think that's it. So I hope I didn't go over too much. Uh, any questions? <laughs>